welcome, Ali Godzi. Hey everyone, welcome. I also want to thank everyone that's watching online. It's a true community event where we get together and move our industry forward. We're really excited about the future of the Lake House and the Unity Catalog. The expo is amazing. There's like a massive ecosystem of partners here. I think Databricks solves the unified data analytics approach to a T. Awesome energy. This is great. I like that we're building it in open source, open standard, really benefiting the community. Up next, Patrick Wendell, co-founder and VP of engineering, Databricks. Hi everyone, and welcome to day two of the main program of the Data and AI Summit. Is everyone having a good time? Okay, I need that a little bit louder so they can hear it in the back. Is everyone having a good time? All right, thank you. Yeah, it's great to see everyone here. Uh, so excited for the 5,000 people that are here in person, as well as everyone that's joining us online, tens of thousands more folks. Yesterday, we heard a lot about foundational investments in the Data Lake House, things like uh, shared catalog, open sourcing of Databricks Delta codebase, and investments in stream processing and SQL performance. Today's program is going one level higher to talk about use cases on the Lake House, especially those around data science and machine learning. So we'll hear from a few folks at Databricks, including myself, about technical investments we're making in the ML platform layer. We'll also hear some applied use cases from folks in industry and even talks from cutting edge researchers that are pushing the state of machine learning forward. So to get started, if we can pull up my talk, I'll kick it off with a little bit about the work we're doing at Databricks on machine learning. So it should come as a surprise to no one that the use of ML in industry is completely exploding. And in fact, at Databricks, of our thousands of customers, almost every single customer is deploying at least a few production machine learning use cases in different areas of their business. But many of us dream a lot bigger than that. In fact, most industry observers think that within a few years, almost every single deployed application will leverage machine learning in some way. Today, I'm going to talk about the gap between where we are today and where we want to be in a few years as an industry. In fact, we see pretty large challenges these days for companies going from early stage initial machine learning models to rolling out machine learning at scale in the organization. And in fact, it's still the case that most ML projects don't make it all the way to production. So I'm going to talk about what we're doing at Databricks to help solve this gap and enable ML to have much wider reach. So where does ML get stuck? Well, most organizations start their ML journey in the same way. They have a small team of data scientists and machine learning engineers. They choose a few use cases where they think ML can produce a lot of value. And they tend to focus on simpler use cases first, ones where the data sets are relatively static, where the problem definition is relatively simple. For instance, maybe forecasting your sales or predicting which customers are going to churn. Those are things you can do once every few weeks. You can have humans take action on the result, and you can do them on mostly static data sets. And those use cases actually have been really, really successful. And so companies want to scale up and do more and more and more. But where companies get stuck is in this journey from a few early use cases in machine learning to doing machine learning at the scale of the entire organization. We call that production ML. What that means to us at Databricks is hundreds or thousands of models, not a small number of models, and a model lifecycle that's deeply embedded with your application. So that means that models need to be constantly retrained based on new data. It's not necessarily a human that's going to consume the result of a model. It's actually your end user facing product. And when you're doing ML at scale, you need conventions and common stacks so that tens or hundreds of different teams can use the same software and do things in the same way. And in fact, those teams may be not ML experts. They may actually just be your application engineers. So this transition is really hard. There's many ba barriers to it, organizational and technical. I'm going to talk about what we see as the largest technical barriers to having ML deployed pervasively in an organization. And a lot of it comes down to interacting with legacy or incumbent software stacks. So it's going to get a little nerdy, but hopefully you all can bear with me. ML teams, when they first start, typically purchase or sort of self-make an ML 
analytical stack. That's some, a, a piece of software or a set of software suites that know how to deal with training models, evaluating models, collaborating over the development of models. And that works well for these small-scale use cases because they're relatively enclosed. But when you want to have ML done at scale in your organization, you need to play well with two incumbent software stacks. These are very large-scale, often very mature pieces of software infrastructure in any company. And on the left, you have your data engineering stack. So that's your core data pipelines, your speeds and feeds. On the right, you have your online service stack where you deploy your applications, often containerized environments. And unfortunately, these stacks were not designed with ML in mind. And they also weren't even designed to work particularly well with each other. But ML comes in and cuts totally across these, because every model you build needs to be based on a data and hopefully a very fresh data set. And it needs to be deployed all the way to the production environment. So you suddenly have to do a lot of horizontal integration across these different pieces of software. And why is that integration hard? Well, it's hard because they sort of all speak different languages. The data engineering stack is concerned with data sets. The way they think about security is very data centric. The way they think about quality is very data centric. On the right, your services stack is all about you know, locking down and securing access to production. It's about rolling back and forward different services and setting access control about who can do what. And then your ML stack introduces these new abstractions, models. These are pretty important for ML. But your data engineering stack and your service stack don't even really know what models are. So even doing really simple things across these stacks is extremely difficult. As an example, if you're just deploying a basic ML use case, you need to give the users who are building that permissions to do what they need to do. Well, now you need to touch your permissioning system over data. You need to touch your permissioning system in the ML stack. And you need to touch your permissioning system in the production engineering stack. They might not even use the same abstractions to talk about security and access control. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to walk through a specific example. I'll even dare to demo this, uh, what we think is a better way to do things. And the example I chose is a very canonical machine learning use case, which is ad optimization. Your company probably doesn't do ad optimization, but it's just a good example of how you integrate things across the entire lifecycle in order to deploy an end-to-end -end machine learning product. So very quickly, I'll explain the ad optimization problem. This is all about showing people ads online. I know all of our, it's all of our favorite thing. Um, you have impressions, which is when you actually show someone an advertisement. You're hoping to get them to click on that. And really, more importantly, you're hoping to get the person to eventually make a purchase. And to some extent, you care about how often those impressions convert into clicks. That's called click-through rate. But you really care about actually how often people are buying. So if you just naively look at click-through rate, you may not be optimizing the right metric. So now let's take this example ML problem and look at it in the context of our existing stacks. So as you can see, different pieces of the puzzle are in different parts of the infrastructure. Your impression and click data is on the left in your data infrastructure. Um, your ML models, which versions of models are deployed, where those models were trained are in your ML infrastructure. And your online service is sort of hosting the actual request response for these uh, live queries against the infrastructure. So let's say you want to do something really simple. You just want to ask, is my model performing well? Am I making money, or are we not making money? You know, My boss is giving me a hard time. Are we actually making money with this thing? Well, each of these stacks has a different notion of what it means to be functioning well. Unfortunately, none of them are about making money. You might ask your data engineering stack, is everything working? And they'll say, yes, the data pipeline is behind by 15 minutes. It's within our SLA. We're doing great. You might ask your ML stack, you know, how's it going? Is it working? And they'll say, yes, I've scored this many requests over this amount of time. And you'll ask your service stack, does everything look good to you? And they'll say, yes, the service is not returning 400s. It's working. Everything's great. But unfortunately, you don't care about any of these things. You just care about whether you're making money or not. So let's say you wanted to figure out if you're making money or not. Well, you're in for quite a challenge, because the data you need to answer that question is spread across all these different stacks. As a very simplified example, your impression and purchase data is sitting in your data engineering stack. And that's probably in some tables that have some echoes over them. The actual data about which version of the model you're comparing against is in your ML stack. And as an example here, we're saying that's not actually available in a table. It's over some REST API. So you need to integrate with that. And your online service happens to log all the requests and responses in JSON blobs somewhere. The way you authenticate and even get access to these things is probably different. And if you really want to integrate all these data sources to see if your model is even behaving well, you're in for a lot of pain, manual integration work, and tons of custom engineering. 
And what we see in our customers is that instead of going through this pain, they simply don't do this. Or they only do it for a very small number of models where they're willing to do a lot of extra engineering. But if you want to get to hundreds or thousands of models in an organizational scale, it's just not going to work. So what's a better way to do this? Well, if you've been at this conference, you probably know what this shape means. And the better way to do it is to do all of these things inside of one software stack that has shared abstractions. In particular, has shared abstractions over data. So data is not in JSON blobs and REST APIs. It's always in a consistent type of table. And shared abstractions over governance. So permissioning doesn't happen in six different systems. You have one way of giving access to things. The lake house has long been popular for data sets. That's kind of where it often starts. And in the last few years, Databricks has added ability to train and build models. I'm happy to say that today, we're announcing the last leg of the stool, which is that you'll be able to do full end-to-end -end service deployments of your models inside of the Databricks Lakehouse. And I'm going to dare to demo this quickly, actually. Now, this is a totally live demo. The internet might not even work. But let's see if we can get up the demo on my laptop. OK, cool. So I'm actually in an instance of Databricks here. Uh, and I have all the existing things you might normally use in Databricks, like my data pipelines. Databricks in our machine learning product has support for models. This actually already existed. But what do you know? I have a model. By the way, I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. I have a model that's called add click-through rate. Oh, wow. What a happy coincidence. So we newly have in Databricks the ability to take this model and serve it. So if I click on the Serving tab, you see I actually have two different versions of this model. I have a staging version and a production version. They can actually both be live at the same time. And each of these is running on Databricks managed serving infrastructure. So I can do things like scale the number of VMs up and down, the number of cores, the number of GPUs that I need. And I can even scale all the way down to zero. And we've invested a lot in Databricks at making the initial scale up very fast. So if you have models that aren't used very often, you can save a lot of money by scaling them all the way down to zero. So Built-in model deployments are super slick. You're already training your model there. You just click a button, and you're able to deploy it to production. We also offer high SLAs and scalability. But what's even cooler is that since Databricks is aware of all the data sets involved here, we're able to built-in provide monitoring for these models. So that whole data integration task you saw before, where I need to get the requests that are being logged from my production infrastructure, I need to merge it with my data sets, that's actually all done for you in Databricks. Most of it can be done out of the box, and you can augment it with your own metrics if you'd like. So in this example, this model has a few different things that are inputs to its monitoring. This table on the top left is actually automatically logged requests that are coming from the Databricks infrastructure, where we, every time a particular request is scored against the model, we log it for you in a table. But then we also integrate that with other da data to provide the end-to-end -end metric of how much revenue am I making in this particular production deployment. So since these are all delta tables, Databricks keeps them updated and, and manually curated for you. And on top of that, you can use all the other tools that the Databricks platform has to do things like monitoring. So here's a dashboard that allows you in real time to see all this data for this particular model. And we can look at things like the click-through rate. As I said, you know, click-through rate is important, but it's not the, the thing we care about the most. We care about this thing called the conversion rate on the right. And here we're seeing how it's drifting over time. And this dashboard even can even add alerts. Like, if the conversion rate exceeds some particular threshold of drift from what I'm expecting, please alert me. The most important thing isn't being able to do this for this one particular model. It's that in your company, if you want to deploy hundreds or thousands of different models, Every team can have access to infrastructure like this without having to deploy any new systems or deal with integration across stacks. All right, so I think we'll go back to my slides. So just to reiterate, we're announcing actually two things today, both our serverless model endpoints and integrated model monitoring. These are both in private preview stage. We're already working with several customers on these. If you're interested in using these now, please talk to your Databricks customer success representative. And they'll be pre coming out to public preview in the next few months, so you'll be able to try it out relatively soon. So just to recap what we talked about today, we talked about getting to machine learning at scale inside of a company and what you need to do that. And the three big things are a unified data model, so you're not stitching data together across these services, some shared governance and security primitives, and a way to standardize the workflow across many different teams. Our view at Databricks is that the only way to get these three things is to put all the lifecycle in a single stack, which we call the lake house. 
But whatever your approach is, you definitely need to get these three things right in order to scale. So I'm happy to welcome a colleague of mine, Casey Ulanut, who will be talking about the work Databricks is helping curate not only in our product, but in the open source ecosystem and in MLflow 2.0 that focuses on the last box here, which is standardizing the ML workflow. It's just another way of achieving organizational scale for machine learning. So please join me in welcoming Casey Ulanut. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Patrick. I'm excited to share a community update on MLflow. MLflow is a popular tool for managing the lifecycle of machine learning applications. We built MLflow to provide an open standard for tracking, packaging, and deploying machine learning applications so that teams can focus on building the best models for their domain rather than having to create and maintain bespoke ML platform solutions. As Patrick mentioned, this focus on tracking, packaging, and deploying machine learning applications is now often called MLOps. We launched MLflow in 2018, and since then, we have become the most popular MLOps framework. We've had hockey stick growth, putting us now at the same order of magnitude as the top ML libraries. We've also seen incredible community momentum 75% of our public roadmap was completed by contributors outside of Databricks. So thank you all for your contributions. Over the last year, we've also had some new major features, including MLflow auto-logging, which makes it so you no longer have to pollute your code base with many lines of logging instrumentation, as well as our evaluation API, which makes it so that you can perform offline evaluation on a holdout data set. The last thing I want to call out is that we now support time series frameworks of Facebook Profit and PMD Arima so that you can track and manage your forecasting projects. So what's next for MLflow? Well, as Patrick mentioned, organizations are struggling to build and deploy machine learning applications at scale. And many ML projects never see the light of day in production. As a result, we're starting to see organizations build centers of excellence and internal machine learning platform teams. And they're trying to automate and codify ML practices to accelerate this path to production and give projects a chance of making it all the way. And the way that they're doing this is building conventions around code layout, testing, and CI-CD integration. But the reason that all of this is necessary is because of three main friction points on the path to production. The first is the getting started problem. There's a lot of tedium and toil involved in getting started with greenfield machine learning projects. And data scientists end up having to write the same code over and over again. The next friction point is that iteration speed is slow. Many data scientists are writing in monolithic notebooks, and it's really hard to maintain uh, control of your execution context, especially when you're rapidly iterating. And so what ends up happening is they're rerunning their entire notebook over and over again, which is not only costly time-wise, but also compute-wise. And lastly, perhaps the biggest friction point is the productionization step, where the transition or handoff from exploration to production is manual. And it involves a production engineer often rewriting code, refactoring that code, and making sure that that code is going to work in a production environment. And to make this worse, production engineers are often limited in organizations, meaning that the number of projects that can actually get to production are bottlenecked by the availability of production engineers. So no single MLOps framework today solves all three of these challenges. And that's why we're seeing the centers of excellence and in internal ML platform teams are building their own bespoke solutions on top of MLflow. But no more. Today, I'm excited to introduce MLflow 2.0, which is coming soon. 
And it's going to solve these challenges with a new component called MLflow Pipelines. Thank you. MLflow Pipelines are a structured framework to help accelerate teams' path to deployment. And a pipeline is just a predefined graph with a set of user customizable steps and built on top of a workflow engine. And there are three main benefits of MLflow pipelines. The first are templates. Templates contain all the code and configuration needed to quickly get started with a project without a data scientist having to write a single line of boilerplate code. The next is our pipeline engine. Our pipeline engine memoizes steps. So that's only rerunning the parts of the pipeline that are necessary based on the code changes you've made. And lastly, we're providing an opinionated structure. And this opinionated structure involves modularized, production-ready code so that teams can have fully operable machine learning applications straight out of the box. And this structure is also going to allow teams to automate that handoff from exploration to production so that a production engineer can focus on building an automated system around production rather than being a manual step in it. So now that we know more about MLflow pipelines, let's go check it out in a demo. So I'm going to demo this inside of Databricks, but MLflow pipelines works in local development as well. So you can do it in your IDE of choice or in Jupyter. You can see here that I've already initialized my pipelines project. And it's scaffolded out an entire directory structure for me. So I have a data directory. I have a steps directory, which is going to contain a Python script file for every step in my predefined graph or DAG, as well as a test directory. I'm going to start by looking at my YAML file. So my YAML file is my configuration for my pipeline. In this demo, I'm going to solve the age-old problem of trying to predict the taxi fare in New York City. So I'm sure we're all familiar with that problem. And so I'm going to specify that my template is going to be a regression template, because that's the kind of problem I'm trying to solve. I then need to specify my data location. I then need to specify also my prediction column. So what am I trying to predict? In this case, again, my taxi fare amount. The last thing I want to show you in this configuration is my validation criteria. You can specify how you want your model to be validated. And so you can set your primary evaluation metrics as well as the threshold that they must meet in order for your model to be validated. So again, this is my configuration file to help set up my pipeline. I'm now going to open a Databricks notebook. And this notebook is going to function as sort of an orchestration notebook for me to mess around with my pipeline. So you can see here that I've initialized my pipeline and code. And then I've gone ahead and run p.run train. This command is going to execute my pipeline all the way up and through the train step. When it does this, you can see that it's auto-generated these various step cards. These step cards are going to are automatically generated and standardize how models are evaluated and how data is profiled across all of my projects. So you can see here, for example, we show you your model architecture, your model schema, and perhaps most interestingly, we're going to show you your examples with the largest prediction error. To check out this one, I can show you that, for example, in this first one, my taxi fare amount is almost $100. But if I come over here, my trip duration was only a couple of minutes. So something fishy is going on here. And if anything, this is a pretty excessive outlier. And so scorecards like this are really helpful because they're automatically generated and give me, as a data scientist, the info that I need to know if I need to iterate on my data or on my model to improve my model quality. Speaking of quality, I'm going to scroll down to where I've run p.run evaluate. And here I'm going to have more step cards auto-generated for me. And I'm going to go to my model validation step card. You can see here that, sure enough, my model has not passed all of my validation criteria that I specified in that YAML. We also create a model explainability step card, 
so you can see that we generate a shaft plot for you automatically so you can better understand which features are important. And so in this case, only trip distance is really impacting my model. All right, so now because my model hasn't passed all these tests, I want it to actually be validated. I have a suspicion that this is because I have those outliers, and my first model is actually a linear regression model. So instead, I'm going to make it a decision tree regressor, which is less sensitive to outliers. So I'm going to come into my steps directory, and I'm going to go to my train.py. And sure enough, you can see here that I have a linear regression model that was trained. And I'm just going to copy paste in code to make it a decision tree regressor instead. Now I'm going to go back to my orchestration notebook. And just at the end of this, I'm going to call the evaluate command again. So p.run evaluate. And now I'm going to see what my new model validation performance scorecard is. The important thing to note here is that this is where our smart workflow engine comes into play. You can see, if you look closely, that it already started logging to my MLflow experiment, meaning it started on the train step. I'm going to quickly jump to this DAG representation of the pipeline, where you can see that there was an ingest step, a split step, and a transform step. But all of those were already cached. And because they're unchanged between my two runs, they don't need to be rerun. And so we're only rerunning the train step and the evaluation step here. So while this is finishing, I'm going to go ahead and click into my MLflow experiment. One of the great things about MLflow pipelines is that it's natively integrated with the rest of MLflow, meaning you're getting all of the tracking goodness that comes with MLflow. If I click into one of these runs, you can see that all my parameters and metrics are tracked for me. And if I zoom in down here to the artifacts, you can see my environment is logged. My SHAP explainer is logged for me, so now I can explain all my predictions. And we're even going to take a snapshot of your pipeline at the time of that run. So you can see the exact configuration for your pipeline, as well as even the code associated with it. And of course, we're going to log your feature importance plots for you as well. So I'm going to go back to my orchestration notebook, where you can see this evaluation run has completed. If I go to my model validation results, you can see now that I've moved to a decision tree, all of my criteria has now been met, and my model is validated. And for fun, if I go to my feature importance plot, you can see now that distance and duration are primarily influencing my fair amount predictions. All right, so now that I've trained a better model, I'm ready to put this into production. So to do that, I'm going to come to repos, and I'm going to submit a pull request. And this is where the real power of MLflow pipelines comes in. My code is already modularized. My code is already production ready. I didn't have to go to a production engineer and have to spend time back and forth iterating on this code base with them. Instead, I can just go ahead and submit this pull request. And now the production engineer can focus on building an automated CI CD system to take the remainder of this project all the way to production. And that's what we are excited about with MLflow pipelines. Yes. So MLflow pipelines, again, are this predefined graph built on top of a smart workflow engine to really help accelerate the path to production for organizations. And it's also empowering production engineers to now build these automated systems around pipelines and for the production process rather than being stuck as a manual component in it. Again, MLflow uh, pipelines are part of MLflow 2.0, which is coming soon. There's other exciting announcements in there as well, but you're just going to have to stay tuned for those. In the meantime, you can use MLflow pipelines today in beta form in MLflow 1.27, which is out today. And we would love for you to join our discussion in the open community on our open repo. Thank you all, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Data and AI Summit. Great. So next, we're going to hear from two companies who are both deploying machine learning on the lake house. 
One is a company you may know for making tractors, John Deere, and another is a company which is into it, but they're both deploying machine learning to radically transform their business. So I'll start by welcoming Ganesh Jayaram from John Deere. Please join me in welcoming Ganesh. Thank you. We started breaking ground by breaking ground. We've always looked to the land for what we need and always made the tools to work with it. We won't stop making what we make better for today and for tomorrow. Because at John Deere, what we bring to the table touches lives around the world. We know we can't rest. We run for the humble, the hungry, the growing world. It's why you'll see our logo proudly stamped on machines and hats, on arms and in homes, and the loyalty to it passed down through generations. We run with the dignity that makes us dear. We strengthen relationships. We solve problems. Innovating on behalf of humanity and planet. In service of the people who trust us and the earth that sustains us. You'll find us where hard iron meets hard data. We don't make gimmicks, fads, or empty promises. We make machines that do more and use less. Machines that make life better. Because we don't run just to move faster than the rest. We run so life can leap forward. Up next, Ganesh Jayaram, CIO, John Deere. Every morning and every day, 75,000 of my colleagues globally and I are motivated by this noble purpose to help our customers revolutionize the world of agriculture and construction and drive sustainable outcomes that help each of us here in the room, our local communities, and the planet at large. At John Deere, we run so that life can leap forward. Just over two years ago, we announced an exciting new vision and our smart industrial strategy that aims to bring our legacy of manufacturing excellence and combine that with smart technology innovation. Our new operating model has three core tenets. First, we reorganize our equipment solutions around the way our customers carry out activities in the field. We call that production systems. We recognize that our customers need to be supported through distinctive products, parts, and service all through the life cycle of the equipment. And so we double down our focus through the life cycle solutions group. And then to bring technology to the forefront, we standardized the development of technology as well as product development under the enterprise technology stack. Becoming more data centric is the core of being a smart industrial company. Our mission is very simple. We aim to engineer and deliver equipment solutions that leverage data to drive more precise outcomes out in the field. As part of the smart industrial strategy, we have a similar intent to run our business operations as intelligently as our machines in the field. We aim to use data to reimagine the different business operations within the core of the John Deere enterprise. 
fields of manufacturing, engineering, finance, HR, and the like that are going to use data and analytics to drive high levels of productivity and innovation across the board. And all of that is done through a common information technology stack, which has components of analytics and data at the very top of it. At John Deere, we serve a wide range of customers globally. Think about agriculture. In the world of farming, customers in Asia farm on less than 100 acres of land, whereas here in North America, South America, and in parts of Europe, they use our equipment to farm on tens of thousands of acres. But their needs are exactly the same, which is show that you understand me and you deliver solutions that enable me to drive sustainable outcomes at the end of the day through use of data and analytics. As a technology function, we serve many other stakeholders, both internal as well as external. So whether it's a parts operations or manufacturing operations, and again, there the need is exactly the same. Deliver digital solutions that enable me to drive better outcomes in terms of efficiency of operations and the like. To put some context to the data that we're talking about here, we produce 100 distinct lines of equipment in service of our customers globally. It's roughly over 450,000 of these large ag and construction equipment that are telematically streaming data from every step in the value chain. We collect all of that data from a customer standpoint. From our internal operations standpoint, we have over 100 edge locations, be it parts warehouses, be it manufacturing locations. We're using sensors and technologies to drive high levels of quality across our internal operations. Most of our 75,000 employees around the, around the world are producing and consuming data to drive our internal operations more effectively. All of the data comes together in our enterprise data lake. We've had eight petabytes of data that's ingested today. That's roughly a 20 time increase here over the last three years. We convert all of that raw data into intelligence and insights using the John Deere Data Factory. Think of the John Deere Data Factory as a single stop, cloud-based data and analytics um, organization, wherein we've organized all these high volumes of data that's being ingested, store it, curate it, and make it accessible to our analytics professionals, both within the technology function as well as everywhere across the enterprise. So they can run data models that drive those analytical insights that we talked about earlier. It's all built on a lake house architecture. The premise of scale, we can ingest all different types of data, structured, unstructured, semi-structured data from batch processes, from streaming processes. We run analytical models, the basic BI models, all the way to more sophisticated, predictive, and prescriptive models. We ensure that we are democratizing the use of data and analytics, putting the right privacy and security controls in place, and managing the use of data responsibly across the board. Again, six-fold increase over the last three years in terms of number of data sets, 40-fold increase in terms of business cases, and seven-fold increase in terms of number of users across the enterprise that are using these data and analytical models. And I'll tell you, we're just getting started. Because as we ingest this pipeline of data in seconds as opposed to uh, weeks and days it is to take us in the past, we're going to see an exponential increase in terms of data and analytics across the enterprise. An example of one such business use case is from those telematically enabled machines that are out in the field. That machine data is ported in to the enterprise data lake. Our data scientists have created models that look at trends that diagnose a failure event that's likely to happen. These models automatically let our dealer technicians know that it's time to call our customers and arrange for maintenance to take place before the machine suffers downtime. So in doing so, we are upholding our core value of quality while also ensuring uptime and high economic value for our customers. We are building a culture across John Deere where data and analytics is everyone's responsibility. I've talked at length about the tools such as the Lakehouse architecture. As importantly, we're making sure that we are investing in an organization structure that supports our data engineers and data scientists through a period of continual learning. We have a forum where we're sharing these best practices across the board. At John Deere, both within the technology function and the company at large, we are running hard, running hard using data and analytics in service of our customers who are engineering better solutions for the world at large. If you are excited by this higher purpose of using data and analytics to drive a different outcome 
for the world at large. Click on the QR code, look at the link, or contact any one of us out here. Thank you for your time and attention. Please welcome Alana Mitt, VP of Product, AI and Data, Intuit, and Manish Amde, Director of Engineering, Intuit. Thank you for the introduction, Patrick, and thank you all for being here. Intuit's mission is powering prosperity around the world. To really achieve that, to actually have an impact on people's lives, we need to do more than get you through the motions of filling forms and filing taxes. We need to offer significant, meaningful, helpful advice to help you thrive in your financial life as an individual or as a small business owner. We are transforming into an AI-driven expert platform, which means that we will be offering this advice either via ML or upon request by instantly connecting you with a human expert. We measure the success of this not merely by revenue goals or number of users, we seek to actually have an impact. We want to put more money in people's pockets and help them retain it for longer. We've declared a bold goal of doubling household savings for our customers by 2025, and we're already making progress towards this goal. We want to help small businesses thrive. We've declared a bold goal of achieving a 10% improvement in the success of small businesses after five years over the national average. Let me give you two examples of what this concretely means. <clears throat> Back at the beginning of the pandemic, small businesses were struggling. The government was offering a paycheck protection program, a program to offer forgivable loans to small businesses so that they can continue to pay their employees during the hard days of the pandemic. But we knew that small businesses were struggling to navigate the procedure of getting these loans. And we knew we needed to step in to help. That's one example of a challenge that we faced a couple of years ago. An ongoing challenge we're facing, just to give another example, is classifying transactions. Helping anyone in their financial life starts with understanding how their money is being spent. To do so, we need to be able to classify transactions. But classifying transactions is not global, it's not universal, it's very personalized. Each and every one of us, each and every one of you classifies transactions differently. So we knew we have to build ML models that are very, very personalized. And I'll pass it on to Manish to talk a little bit about how this is done. Thanks, Alon. We are tackling dozens of such challenges spanning AI, analytics, and real-time applications. Our data journey started at a place that would be familiar to many of you in the audience. Our data ecosystem was big, complex, and messy. We needed a strategy to unlock the full potential of this data for our consumers and small business customers. Under any circumstances, this would have been an incredible challenge. But given the growth and expansion of our company over the past few years, it's been even more so. In a sense, we had to learn the art of building the plane while flying it. By managing hundreds of thousands of tables with petabytes of data and harnessing decades of historical information siloed across various systems, all while nearly doubling the user base to over 100 million customers and significantly expanding our product portfolio. To catalyze our data journey, we needed a single unified architecture that could break down the data silos and accelerate productivity for teams across the company. This architecture needed to be capable of supporting diverse workloads, massive scale for both storage and compute, support real-time applications via streaming, and it needed to be built on top of open source to give us the benefit of using best-in-class tools an opportunity to give back 
to the community. This led to the adoption of a lake house architecture. Here's a high level view. On the left, we have data coming in from various systems in different formats. All of this data is curated and materialized in our clean data lake powered by Delta Lake. The data is further processed for aggregations, enrichment, featureization, etc. A majority of this processing is powered by Apache Spark, including Spark Streaming. Next, the data is explored, ex explored by hundreds of users using DB SQL and notebooks powered by Photon. We have recently started adopting MLflow to streamline machine learning for our data scientists. All of this lakehouse metadata is registered into what we call the Intuit data map. And all of these systems come together to power the AI, analytics, and real-time applications on the right. Intuit's data map is the registry for all business critical data at Intuit. It consists of three broad categories of information. The first category is the physical layer. It captures where the data and the code that generates the data is located. The second category is the operational layer. It captures information such as the ownership info, the system dependencies, and data classification. Both these categories of information are necessary to build a healthy operational system and are typically provided by most data platforms. You probably already have one of these. What's missing is meaning, the rich semantic information required by users to easily and successfully make use of this data. We call this the business layer. It captures the business context, the logical model of the data formally captured as an entity, and the relationship to other entities within and across its business domains. All these three layers come together to help us answer all possible questions that producers or consumers have about data in the lake house. With that, we have been able to build a delightful data discovery experience, enabling users to search and browse data and explore relationship to other business entities. Core entities such as user, product, transaction, and company are fully represented in the data map. Developers, data scientists, machine learning engineers, and analysts have the complete view of the data in a single place, eliminating the need to query multiple systems. Our journey to build this data map has begun about two years ago still ongoing. It is a company-wide endeavor. It's not something that Manish or I are doing together. It's everyone at the company is now seeing data as a core element and are producing clean entities to power the solutions we're discussing. I just want to go back to the customers that I started with. During the pandemic, as we were helping small businesses navigate the Paycheck Protection Program, we were able to support 40,000 businesses and deliver $1.4 billion in loans to these small businesses using the data infrastructure that Manish described. I mentioned the challenge of classifying transactions in a personalized manner. We now have 2 million personalized models to help people classify transactions in their language, refreshed daily. And again, those are just two examples, and the journey has just begun together with Databricks. Thank you all. So great machine learning and data science requires great data. And the next two speakers will be talking about getting data into the lake house. I'm happy to welcome Stacy Kirkla, an engineering director from Databricks, followed by Michael Armbrust, a distinguished engineer at Databricks, the creator of the Catalyst SQL optimizer, and the guy who you saw yesterday telling you that we're open sourcing all of Delta. 
But first, please join me in welcoming Stacy Karkola. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Hi, everyone. I'm Stacy, and I'm super excited to talk to you today about Databricks workflows, which I've been working on for the past several years. And Databricks Workflows is the orchestrator that's deeply integrated in the lake house. It's there to reliably power all of your recurring and streaming tasks, whether that's ingestion, analysis, or ML. That integration makes it easier to focus on your work. We'll take care of your jobs and workflows. They'll be there to power all the work you care about. Now, we haven't talked as much about this part of the product recently. But Workflows drives a vast amount of Databricks usage. In fact, it's our most used service, creating 10 million virtual machines a day. I've actually heard that's the largest number from any service on one of the three large cloud providers. Now, a lot of this is ETL and Spark, as most of you expect. However, there's also a large portion of AI training, inference, and other data science and analytics tasks that already leverage Workflows today. In fact, 30% of the workflows we're running aren't Spark at all. 10% of them are actually running anything anywhere on single node clusters, for instance, orchestrating other services or doing file operations. And that's why more than 7,000 Databricks customers already take advantage of the benefits that Databricks workflows is bringing because we've made orchestration of data analytics and AI easy for them. And here I'm going to talk about five of the things that have, they love about workflows. It's a fully managed lake house orchestration service that makes it possible for your analysts to build reliable workflows on any cloud. First up, it's not just Spark. We actually orchestrate anything anywhere. That's SQL, it's Python notebooks, it's Delta live tables, it's even DBT projects. And you can schedule and orchestrate these dependencies between all these types of tasks across any platform, including our partner services. Second, it's super easy to create these workflows with an intuitive UI. I'll show you that in a demo in just a minute. But this really democratizes data by enabling more and more analysts or analytics engineers to run demanding workflows in production easily. That gives data engineers the freedom to focus more on the data. Of course, you can always use our API to control things like CI CD flows where you need that automatic integration and the UI is not right. Workflows is also deeply integrated in the Databricks Lakehouse platform. That means that our users don't have to switch back and forth between tools. All the platform features are natively integrated and can be used easily especially all the security features that your enterprise requires, including Unity Catalog. And of course, we're bringing integrated monitoring and alerting to these e asynchronous workloads. You get all the benefits from tool consolidation on one unified, holistic Lakehouse platform without the need for a lot of toil or dedicated infrastructure. And Databricks Workflows is a fully managed service that lets you, again, focus on your data not your operations. We've been running the largest orchestration service on the planet, so a major focus of our team has been and needs to continue to be stability at scale. So much so, I have to zoom pretty far in to see that it's only three and a half nines right now. We've been improving that underlying service for years. It's now handling cloud incidents and limitations every day smoothly, shielding your critical workloads from disruption. But enough about words. Let me move to my demo. OK, I'm going to start out this demo the same way all of you start your day, by opening up my Slack messages. The first thing I see is that I had an issue last night. I can easily see exactly what the error message is, exactly which workspace, job, run, and task were failed. I see their names, I see their ID numbers, and links directly to all of them, as well as important information about when that run started, how long it went, and how it was launched. And I can click directly through to the job run that was involved. 
Without going into too much detail about the job itself, what I see is that the top center desk task in the DAG, shark sightings, failed. It has a red bar on the top. Everything below that is light pink, and that's because it was skipped because it needed a dependency. And on the right side, I see some more details about exactly how it was run. But I'm going to skip straight into repairing that job run, which includes everything you need to pick up where you left off, and nothing you don't. So those successful tasks aren't even there. On the right side, I can also add parameters if I need those to make this run successful. In this case, I would normally just click Repair Run and have the run pick up where it left off. Instead, I'm actually going to take you on a deeper tour of this job first, so I will click Cancel, and then I'm going to click back and show you what this whole job was about. Looking at this job view, it looks a lot like the run view. The center is a DAG of tasks, and I'll go into what each of those are doing in a second. On the left side, I have a palette of additional tasks I can add, including notebooks, jars, and spark submits, your old favorites, some newcomers like Delta Live Tables, Python Wheels, DBT, and SQL. And then on the right side, I have some more details like Creator and Run As, and some other settings like the schedule. What's this job actually trying to do? Obviously, it's predicting shark attacks. It's ingesting files in the weather data. It's scraping APIs in shark sightings and reef data. It's going to combine all of those with a Delta Live table, check for drift, retrain that model, do some batch inference, and let everybody know what's going to happen to the sharks in the next day. The other thing that I notice about this task is some of this, I've been told by my friends like Casey, don't need to happen every day. You only need to retrain if drift is detected. So I've added a task parameter there in the small green box so that retrain is actually conditional. And it only runs a couple times a week right now. And this is what I mean by orchestrating the lake house. I've pulled together a variety of different tools to solve your actual problems. And I'm doing that efficiently using a single automated job cluster that I create and terminate on each job run that isolates your workload from disruption and minimizes startup time and cost by reusing it across all of the tasks. But what this job really needs is a dashboard. I've already coded that up in Databricks SQL, so I'll just drag a SQL task onto the canvas, and I'll look for a SQL task of refreshing a dashboard rather than executing the query or refreshing the alert. I'll look for my dashboard about sharks. There it is, predicted sharks. And then I'll drag in the dependency between batch inference and dashboard. I could have also done that in the right side panel by just selecting it in that drop down. And then create task. Now my dashboard is going to update every day when this runs. And this could indeed run every day. But let's talk about some of the other scheduling options. Now, a daily schedule like that is perfect for predictable batch time-based execution, and it's an excellent way to use autoloader. But we can also use the new file arrival option. And what that will do is start up the compute only when a new file is detected. That'll be much more efficient for things where the delivery is not consistent or predictable, but you want moderate latency and minimum um, cost. If this had been a continuous, if this had been a streaming task, I would have used the continuous option that I'll show you now. And that minimizes all of the options you need to set in order to make sure that everything just runs as you need it to. Now that I've done all that, I'll click Save. I'll actually cancel out of the error, uh, cancel out of the schedule option. And then we can run this now manually as well, of course. Uh, and but let's take a look at how this job has been doing recently. I'll do that by going over to the Runs tab and taking a look at our matrix view. The columns here represent the task duration time from the past several runs, and we see that it's been mostly successful, except for that last run that we already talked about. And you can also see that there's a you know, a row here for each of the different tasks. The dashboard task, of course, hasn't run before because we just added it. And that retrain task, as I described, seems to be running once or twice a week, about what I'd expect. 
I think that's everything I want you to know about predicting sharks for the Dutch Coast Guard. So now let's take a look at a slightly higher level and go to the full job run view for my workspace. What I see here is that last night was pretty successful. There were 2,100 successes, only 21 failures. Those failures seem are only 21 failures. And then on the right side, what we see are the top five error types include some library installations and a few cancels, manual cancels. I can filter to the failed runs by going ahead and clicking on that top bar. And that will filter the table below. And then I can see that it looks like Ned is testing out a WSF <laughs> WSFS job, and I should talk to him about why he's having some trouble getting his test jobs to run. And I can also take a look at how those failures were spread out throughout the last couple days. It looks like there's not too much clumping there, so nothing, no specific incidents I need to diagnose or be concerned about. Across the top bar, I have some additional options I don't have time to show you today, including active runs and running late. And that will help you find those runs that aren't finishing when you expect them to, where you need to take a closer look and possibly intervene before they finish. Hopefully, that's given you a taste of everything that workflows can bring to you, and you're excited to go try this out immediately. It's, of course, live on all three clouds, Azure, AWS, and GCP today. We're super excited for you to see that. And in fact, we've got some breakout sessions coming. Of course, Michael Armbrust will be up in a second to talk to you about Delta Live Tables directly, as well as a breakout at 11.30 with more people from the Delta Live Tables team. 205 today, the Workflows Jobs Overview will talk about our upcoming roadmap. And tomorrow, early in the morning at 8.30, you can learn all about adopting workflows. I'm super excited to see all of you there. Thanks. Please welcome Michael Armbrust, Distinguished Software Engineer, Databricks. Good morning. I'm super excited to be here today, back up on stage, to talk about Delta Live Tables. Delta Live Tables is a product that we released just a couple of months ago that makes it dramatically simpler to do the task of data engineering. Now, why do you even need to do data engineering? Well, it turns out all data starts off messy. And in order to do all of the advanced analytics, machine learning, and AI that we want to do, we have to first incrementally improve the quality of the data so that it's ready for that. We need good, result or good data to get good results. But that pipeline that I just showed was way too simple. That's never what it looks like in real life. Instead, it's always a mess of different tables and tools. You'll find you need to add things like Amazon Glue for ingesting files, Datadog for understanding what's going on on your clusters, uh, CloudWatch so that you can track your cloud costs, orchestration tools like Airflow to run different things and rerun when there's failures, Azure Data Factory for data ingestion, maybe another orchestration tool like Uzi. And finally, you're going to have some users who only know SQL, and so they're going to need something like Synapse. And all of a sudden, this starts to get really complicated, and you find you're spending all of your time on tooling. And that's why we created Delta Live Tables. It's a system that allows you to build reliable data pipelines in a dead simple way. The key idea here is we wanted to dramatically accelerate ETL development by giving you simple declarative languages in SQL and Python. As you can see, these two lines of code, this is actually an entire data pipeline. It ingests a whole bunch of files, in, infers their schema, it does it in a streaming real-time fashion, and then it creates another dependent table that cleans that data to get it ready for consumption. The dependencies are automatically captured, and this is all you have to write. Another key idea here is we want to automatically manage the clusters and the infrastructure that you need to run these pipelines. And I'll talk in a little bit about some of the tools that we use to do that. Just because your SQL queries execute doesn't mean they're going to produce the right answers. So we've been thinking about data quality since the beginning of the project. We've actually built in special language features that allow you to declaratively describe what data quality means in your particular domain. And then the system can automatically let you know when the incoming data violates those expectations. And we give you tunable policies for how to handle those violations. 
And finally, since freshness and real-time data is critical, we unify streaming and batch in one simple declarative framework. As I mentioned, we released a couple of years ago, or a couple of months ago <laughs> into GA, and a ton of customers have already been using it. I want to highlight one example that I thought was really cool from Rivian. They're actually an automaker, and they do a bunch of telematics data. So they look at you know, how different parts are failing in the field so they can automatically do predictive maintenance and service on them. And in one case, they took a manual pipeline that actually used to take over 24 hours to execute, and they were able to bring it down into near real time, and it executes at a fraction of the cost. And we've seen many stories like this amongst our customers. But you might say, how is all of that possible? And that's why I want to take you through a couple of the new features that are coming down the line that are going to make it even easier to build production quality ETL pipelines. The first feature is advanced auto scaling. I can't tell you how many times people have asked me, how many nodes do I need to do X? Well, the answer always is it depends. It depends on what kinds of transformations you're doing. It depends on how big the data set is. It depends on what your SLAs and your budgets are. And enhanced auto scaling is here to help you automatically make that decision. We tie deeply into not only the Spark scheduler, but also into the data sources that are producing data so we know how much data there is to consume. We can then automatically pick when we want to add machines, if and only if they're actually going to help the performance of your pipeline. And when there's capacity that's not being used, we get rid of it immediately. And this is really powerful, because even if you were to sit down and tune your pipeline, spend hours getting exactly the right cluster size, then your data size changes, and you need to do it all again. Advanced auto scaling will automatically do that for you. Another really common problem that I see people struggle with all the time is tracking how data in their lake changes over time. Whether you're in a regulated industry that has to keep an audit trail, or whether you're a machine learning uh, scientist who wants to be able to model reproducibility by getting exactly the data that you train the model on, tracking changes is a very powerful tool. This is a technique often known as slowly changing dimensions type 2, where you actually keep a history rather than updating in place. But implementing this by hand is quite complicated. You have to write big, complicated merge statements with outer joins and window functions. But in DLT, we actually make it just a simple declarative language. You just say, store it as SCD type 2, and we automatically take care of tracking changes to that table. So now you can see in this example, we have a table of cities, and we have you know, the birthplace of Spark, Berkeley, California. But it's spelled incorrectly. So when we want to go and update that data, when a, you know, a new item comes in with that corrected spelling, since we've turned on type 2 SCD, rather than update it in place, it's actually going to do all the bookkeeping to keep track of not only what the new value is, but what this value was in the past and the time periods where different values were present in the database. But now we move on to my favorite topic, which is incrementalization. This is something that all data engineers in the room, I'm sure, have struggled with. Let me start by explaining what I mean by incrementalization. So your input data is always changing. And a naive, simple thing to do and when your input changes would be to just recompute the entire table. So I get one new row here, and I recompute the entire table. Many people do this, and it's not wrong. In fact, it's a, a pretty powerful tool because it's item potent. It's always correct. You can just run it over and over again. But it's obviously very costly. The ideal thing to do here would be to, when a new row appears, just transform that row and move it downstream. But how do data engi engineers do incrementalization? If you excuse me for a moment, I want to nerd, about, nerd out a little bit about some of the techniques that people do here. So the first one is the one I just talked about. It's appending new data as it arrives, but this only works when the query is monotonic. What does it mean for a query to be monotonic? A monotonic query is one where new data in the input will only ever produce new data in the output. It will never result in a retraction. This is a great technique for incrementalizing your queries when it applies. It's very efficient. In fact, when we do this, it's kind of like doing streaming without all the complexity of doing streaming. But it only works for these monotonic queries, selects, projects, joins, uh, and it cannot handle any changes to the input kind of by definition. So there's a couple of other techniques that I see a lot of people use. Another very common one is partition recomputation. Rather than just have one gigantic big table, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to break up the table into little partitions by some property of the data. For example, by date. So in this case, I've broken up both the input and the output by date. And so now when new data arrives or when data changes in one of those partitions, I can only recompute the output partitions where the input data has changed. 
that's obviously dramatically more efficient. This is a pretty cool technique because now we're able to do aggregations and updates to the data, but it has some limitations as well. It requires that the output and input have exactly the same partitioning, which isn't always appropriate. And so that brings us to the final technique, which is really the last 30 years of database research on incrementalized maintenance of materialized views. Basically, the idea here is you can statically analyze a SQL query and you compute exactly how the output is going to change given some input. And if you can do that, now when you have a change to the input, I can actually just produce this delta, how the data downstream is going to change, and I can merge that into the final data set. This is pretty cool. This can handle pretty complicated queries. In fact, like I said, there's 30 years of research on how to decompose queries and do this for more and more complicated types of SQL. It's able to handle updates, inserts, and deletes, which is pretty powerful. But merge is a pretty costly operation. You actually have to read the output table in order to rewrite it. Even with deletion vectors, which we announced yesterday, it's still not particularly cheap compared to just appending data. The other problem is it's super complicated to reason about. You almost literally need a PhD in databases to figure out which queries this applies to and what techniques you can use. So you might be asking yourself, how am I, as a data engineer, supposed to be picking the right technique? And it's actually really difficult. And that's why I'm incredibly excited to announce Enzyme, the first ETL optimizer. <laughs> Enzyme builds on the Catalyst query optimizer, which is built into Spark SQL. Catalyst allows us to analyze these query plans that are doing your transformations for ETL, but we add a new magic trick to that, which is Delta. The delta transaction log tells us how the inputs are changing, and it actually allows us to take those changes and transactionally apply them to the output. So what Enzyme is, is it's basically a layer on top of Catalyst that takes all of these techniques that data engineers already know, it automatically figures out which ones apply to a given situation, and then it has a cost model which will decide what the optimal technique for updating those tables is. What this means is, Given a wide variety of queries, Enzyme is always going to pick the right one. So in this example here, I ran a bunch of different benchmarks with a couple of different types of queries, some simple ETL, some time series aggregation, and a case where there were a large number of changes to the input. You can then see how long each different technique took to modify the downstream table. And what you'll notice is Enzyme always picks the lowest one. When it's simple ETL, it'll just do those streaming appends. When it's time series aggregation and partitioning makes sense, it will use partitioning. If the input changes so much that it's actually cheaper to recompute the table than to try and do a merge, it can even handle that case as well. So if you think this is pretty cool and you want to learn more, I encourage you to come check out our sessions later in the day. Uh, we have both a data engineering session that's going to talk kind of generally about doing ETL on Databricks, as well as a deep dive into Delta Live tables at 1130. Thank you very much. Great, so to close out this morning's keynote session, I'm thrilled to be introducing our three luminary speakers. These folks are at the forefront of both industrial and academic machine learning efforts. Our first speaker will be Hilary Mason, who's the co-founder of Hidden Door and was previously the founder of Fast Forward Labs, a company that ended up being joining forces with Cloudera, where she led their machine learning efforts. Our second speaker will be Peter Norvig, who's a distinguished education fellow at Stanford and also a Google researcher in machine learning. Peter literally wrote the book on machine learning. If you've taken an undergraduate ML class in the last 30 years, you probably used his textbook. And our final speaker will be Andrew Ng, who is, the, among many other accomplishments in his career, he's the co-founder of Coursera. He co-founded Google Brain and also led large industrial ML groups at Baidu. He's also published prolifically in the machine learning space. I'm really excited to get to hear from these three amazing speakers. And please help me kick this off by giving a big round of applause for Hillary Mason. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And hello to everybody joining us online. I'm Hillary. I'm pretty excited to be here talking to you about something a little bit different and a little bit fun. I'm the co-founder of a company called Hidden Door, where we make any work of fiction a playable story. 
That is a creative experience. And I'm going to talk today about the opportunities we have right now, particularly with a few emerging technologies such as few shot learning, large language models, to start to build these sorts of creative experiences and what we need to think about when we design these kinds of data products, because they are a little bit different than some of the other examples we've seen. This is not just a regression. I've been doing this for a long time. So I was the founder of a company called Fast Forward Labs that joined with Cloudera and built a lot of applications where we thought about emerging machine learning capabilities and how they could be made useful. And so here are a few examples from that work, including language generation, summarization, causal inference, interpretability with things like Lime and Shap. And the art of creating these products has changed so much in only the last few years. So data products are products that can't exist without their underlying data. And we might add on those machine learning and AI capabilities. And I know this is incredibly obvious, but I often find that when we walk into rooms, we need to make sure we're using the same vocabulary so we know what we're talking about. And data products are absolutely everywhere. And perhaps the classic old one is the weather prediction, right? Perhaps the oldest data product we all use. But as we gain the technical ability to manipulate and build systems around language, we start to be able to use the frameworks for building data products and analytics to work on things that are largely around human communication. We start to be able to extend our understanding of data products into products that can communicate with us using language, which is the same interface we use to communicate with each other. And so we start to be able to think about things like customer service as a data product. And I, I know we have all had that experience of clicking the chat with a representative and not being sure if we're talking to a bot or a person yet. And so we still we have a ways to go to figure this out. And it's fun to think that here we are in 2022, and we're actually really good at this. If we think back to the conversations we were having 10, 12 years ago, they were all about big data and just being able to have the tools to be able to count something accurately in that data without having to build a whole bunch of custom systems to do it. And today, we have those tools. We've been hearing about them all morning. We have incredible infrastructure that makes it fairly trivial for teams to spin things up easily. But we also have good practices around data, around building teams around data, around the skills we expect people to have with those data. And we have emerging and increasingly interesting capabilities with respect to what we can build on that data, that is, our algorithms, our methodologies. And these things are changing continuously. Some of them change in a slow and linear way, like perhaps there's a project that's really exciting and you see it getting more interest and then it becomes less risky and more uh, useful and so more people adopt it and you can see it over time as something you want to learn about and start to use in your own practice and your own team. Some things, though, change in the way that they offer a new step function capability that perhaps we didn't really see coming or we thought it was coming a little bit further out, um, or that offer us not just the ability to improve something we're already doing, but the ability to actually think about and build entirely new things. And this, for the data practitioners in the room, is why we will never be bored and why we'll never be unemployed for long. And a few of these capabilities that we're seeing today are things like foundational models, particularly drawing out few shot learning. That is the ability to show something, a couple of examples in a prompt, and have it quickly be able to mimic the task as it is demonstrated, um, or even single shot learning. And large language models, which can also generate text or, or completions from these prompts. And these are things that are getting a ton of attention, but are, are still struggling to find their place in products, um, which is why they are at an exciting moment for us to start to think about them. And while we largely see them show up at, as toys and things like uh, Dolly and some of the other image generation stuff, um, it's important to remember that these things are themselves not creative systems, but people are creative. So in these examples, we have a colleague of mine sharing a poem, and the image is mid-journey generated from that poem, which are beautiful. Um, we have someone playing with, uh, with Dolly generating desserts and desserts. Um, 
But these are still really uh, toys, and what is interesting about this is the prompt, that somebody thought of that prompt. And when you have these kinds of changes, we have this opportunity to start to think about new products, and we're seeing that now in this area. Um, and this is a reference to an article I wrote years ago about how to, how to really build an excellent data strategy as opposed to a mediocre or a failing one. But the idea behind it is that when we have this new capability, we have to experiment and start to see where it might be useful. We need communities of people experimenting. Um, and we also encounter new challenges that we have to figure out how to resolve. In particular, and I'll speak about this a little bit more, um, issues with bias in some of these trained models. And so I hope you see this as an opportunity to be imaginative and to build some new things um, and to take on that risk as part of a coherent data strategy, even if it may uh, not be obvious where exactly it's going to pay out. It is worthwhile. One of the things in working on a project like this I've started thinking about a lot in the last couple of years is how do we even build data products when we have no notion of quantitative correctness? We don't have these easy objective functions or error metrics we're trying to optimize. And this emerges in many products. It is not at all new. And in fact, I think I could make the argument that some of the most transformational data products of our time are products of this variety where there is no one correct answer. If you think about the formulation of the problem of web search as potentially trillions of potential results that need to be ranked in real time as they are changing underneath you, given a query that may be in natural language, um, there is no one right answer. And so we have approximations to answers, and we have experimentation, and we have product analysis and product metrics. Another great area for this is content discovery. Anytime you go load up any media site or you're on Netflix and it's offering you things to watch. Um, these are all examples of this sort of class of problem. And it's not new. You might even be working on one of these yourself. And we don't often like to admit it to ourselves as data scientists when things are not clean and they are not neat and there is no easy function. And sometimes we don't know whether a result is good or great. And I, I left failure out here because we know when something is failing. But with these sorts of product experiences, we often have to go to product metrics to understand what good and great look like. And we need to have good taste. And that's not something we often think about as data practitioners. And it is fun, and it is dangerous, and it is potentially the most creative work we might be doing, so something to get excited about. So how do we do this well? Well, first, this is about having the right skills and the right teams. And this means potentially thinking about changing some of those things. Anytime you have uh, work that has to go from one brain to another, you introduce friction. And anytime you have work that has to go from one team to another, you might as well communicate via the medium of PowerPoints. Things will break. So thinking about structures that are focused on product outcomes, not necessarily just on data outcomes or uptime or SLAs. Thinking about designing products that condense information to make it useful to your human being on the other end of the product, that help them get to their destination, that bring them joy in the journey of getting there. This particular art is not about building automated systems to make decisions and disintermediating people. It's about helping people make better decisions because of products that can visualize complex changing information for them in a way that they can then react to. And this is perhaps the most technically provocative thing I want to say today. Use composable architectures. So prioritize tunable components. When you're creating a product, you may not know what the best, um, the best experience is going to be. That means ensemble methods. It means having as much interpretability as your system can allow. And it means we cannot abdicate our design to a giant model. Deep learning in the sky is not going to save us all. We have to understand what goes in, what happens, what comes out to build things that we can compose and tune artistically as well as quantitatively. This also is important when we work with models that may have underlying ethical challenges or bias because of how they're trained. That means I don't think we should avoid them, but it means we need to be deeply aware of those issues and to build systems on either side that capture and mitigate as much of that as possible. 
and that means empathy. So what this looks like in practice, I'll share a couple of examples from more traditional industries, one from a project I worked on a few years ago where we helped commodities traders make better decisions about their strategy based on summarizing about 15,000 news articles a day for them with a personalized summary based on what was in their portfolio. So a lot of cool abstractive summarization, but largely tuned around making the job of someone who before they had this tool would sit in their email reading PDFs for hours simpler so they could access that information and make a decision. It is creative, deeply creative. Um, another example was using language generation and customer support to suggest ways that agents could interact with customers to lead to better outcomes for a large bank. That one also involved a little bit of content discovery because we were trying to figure out what was actually going wrong based on signals in their accounts using language generation and summarization again. Um, and this stuff is actually working in practice today. And I fully believe that the next great set of transformational data products, like the ones we've seen in the past, will be ones that are creative experiences. And what we're working on at Hidden Door is the technology to take any work of fiction and then make it a playable story for you and your friends to play together. It's essentially like an AI dungeon master. And for those of you who are not deep in the RPG world, in the gaming world, it's a system that uses text as an interface and improvises stories along with you, using these large models to provide essentially a trope machine, understanding that people are creative and what matters to you is the story that you want to tell with your friends and family. This means also that bad models just uh, you know, won't work. And so particularly in our architecture, we've built models off of millions of stories, are using large language models for generation, but solving a bit of a different problem where we take the unstructured input, structure it into a data structure, and then generate text and art dynamically out of a data structure, which gives a lot of control, composability, and allows folks who are designers and fluent with language to be able to tune the system independently from the ML research that's going on. This also means that when folks give us that input, they can take that story in whatever direction they like. So once again, I think designing these kinds of creative data products requires a little bit of flexibility in the way we think about our skills as data practitioners. It is only becoming possible now because of the emergence of these large models and the ability to easily play with them. And that's something we can't forget about, that things like having these few shot learning capabilities let us, with a little bit of prompt engineering, which isn't even programming, start to prototype something that might be 80% accurate to understand if it's worth going in that direction at all. These are human affordances we get out of this. All of this pulled together with some changes in the way we build these products, the teams we organize around them, are leading to an opportunity for all of us to start to think about the creative products we might build, whether they're in entertainment, whether they're in finance, whether it's in customer support, whatever it may be, anywhere that language is the interface is an opportunity. So thank you very much. And if our stuff sounds like fun, uh, come sign up and play. Thank you. Please welcome Peter Norvig, AI pioneer and author of Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach. Hello. It's great to be here at this conference, and it's great to be together at any meeting after two years of being pretty much at home. Uh, what what'd you guys over, do over those two years? Well, a lot of what I did was writing books. So first I did this, the fourth edition of the AI textbook with my uh, co-author, Stuart Russell. And then with a different set of co-authors, I wrote this book on uh, data science. And so I think I was asked to be here today to give you an overview of what we found in looking very carefully at these two fields of AI machine learning and in data science and where we feel the field is today and where it might be going. 
So I started off in about 1980 when uh, AI was defined as mostly expert systems. Around 1995, we felt there was a real revolution where things were changing to intelligence assistance. And today, there's another revolution where we're changing to these foundation models. And the technology changed. We went from logic-based to probabilistic to now weight-based. Uh, the approach to writing systems changed from handwriting. It was the blood, sweat, and tears of graduate students so writing things by hand that got things done. And now it's mostly machine learned. We started off thinking algorithms were the key. Then we thought it was data. And now we're really at the point where we say, yeah, we got those things under control. But the hard part now is actually figuring out what is it that we're trying to optimize? What's our objective function? What are we aiming for? What's uh, fair and right? What should we be aiming for? And getting the tools to figure out how to say that and how to get that right, that's where the challenge is today. And the algorithms and data, they kind of keep track of themselves. So that's how the field has changed. Now, for our data science book, we tried to put together a rubric to say, if you're doing a data science project, here are the things you want to worry about to say, is my project going to be successful? So obviously, you've got to have some data. It's got to be the right kind of data. You have to have some technical approach, some algorithm that, that you think is appropriate to the task. You've got to worry about these uh, ideas of, of dependability. So it's not just, can I get the right answer some of the time? It's, have I figured out privacy and security? And uh, do I have defenses against abusers who will try to attack my system? Do I have resilience ag against these problems? And can I make the system understandable? So it's not just, do, am I getting the right answers? It's, can I prove that to my users and win their trust through explanations and reproducibility of, of uh, results? Can I tolerate failures? And then these big questions of ethical, legal, and societal implications and getting those right. Things that, when I started my career, we weren't worried about those. We're saying, you know, we're just doing this academic thing. We don't really have an impact on society. And now we have an impact on society every day. And these things move to the forefront. Now, out of all this, everybody kind of focused in on the technical approach, saying, uh, yeah, that's the hard part. All these other things, sure, I got to worry about those. But it's a technical approach. So what do we have to say about that? Uh, well, you've heard a lot today about uh, machine learning pipelines. And uh, that seems important. And I do a lot of work. Uh, working with startup companies and advising them in their uh, machine learning. And we teach them uh, to think of things this way. You can explore the data, identify data sources that you might want to use, curate it. Maybe you need to supervise this data by uh, labeling it through crowdsourcing or something else. And then you've got to evaluate and debug your models and now adapt this to your business needs, deploy it, serve it, and monitor it. You've heard a lot about tools to do that today and then continuously modify and improve. And so again, there's this big pipeline. And again, everybody focuses in and says, uh, well, this is going to be the hard part. And we actually ask these teams, as they're getting started with their projects, where do you think you're going to end up spending most of your time? What do you think is going to be the hard part? And almost unanimously, they say, well, the hard part's going to be that machine learning model. There's all these complicated uh, Greek letters of sigmas and uh, partial derivatives and all these matrices and so on. So that's going to be really hard. And this other stuff, I think I understand. That's just data. I've done that before. So that's the preconception. Once they start working on it for a while, it almost invariably changes to say, you know what? The machine learning model part, that was actually easy. There are great tools for that. But it was wrangling the data up front. That was the hardest part. And then actually serving it and maintaining it and monitoring it, that was pretty hard too. So they completely reverse where they think the problems are. And that's where the tools should be. Now, why was the machine learning model so easy? And I think one of the reasons is, is that these models are differentiable. So if you have an error coming out, you can differentiate backwards, and you can eliminate that error or reduce that error. And it goes all the way back from the output to the models to the input. But notice, that's just for this one small part of the whole pipeline. And I think if we're going to make progress as a field, 
we really want this whole pipeline to be differentiable. So what do I mean by that? I mean, when there's a change in the world, you want the pipeline to be able to update and say, now I'm going to do something else. So what does that mean? Well, up front, these steps one through four, this was figuring out your data sources and curating the data and cleaning the data and so on. And you make some choices doing that. You say, for this data, I'm going to throw out this field. I'm going to average this. So I'm going to add in such and such. And let's say you made the perfect choice for that of, uh, of how you should manage that data. Now you deploy it and everything works. But six months from now, the world has changed, and maybe that choice is no longer the right one. But there are no automated tools to say, let's go back, and this is the, ch the choice point that you should revisit. And I think we need to, help to start building those tools so we can go end to end and figure out uh, what the best approach is, what we have to change, how we're going to improve continuously. And that, I think, is one of the reasons why these large foundation models are so successful is because they are end-to-end -end in one large system rather than being composed of a lot of components. So that's a challenge for our field. Now, I said that these ethical considerations are, are very important. In our data science book, uh, we went back to the Belmont report, which was a reply to some of the ethical challenges in the medical profession, where there were experiments that were done unethically in the, in the 70s and before. And this report came up with, with three main uh, aspects that everyone should consider. It's respect for persons. So people should have the right to act autonomously, which meant informed consent for experiments and so on, and, uh, and other applications for data science applications. Beneficence, do no harm, mitigate the risks. And justice, that everybody should be treated fairly. And if there are risks and benefits, we want, we want to allocate them equally across people. Now, how are we going to, to do that as a field? And I think that's a real challenge for us. I think the first place it starts is with self-regulation, that companies have to be doing a good job to win the public's trust. They have to put in place uh, their own set of guidelines and, and adhere to them and monitor them and make sure they're doing the, the right job to build systems that are fair and mitigate risk and harm. There's always going to be some government regulations, things like uh, GDPR and so on, and we have to ad adhere to them. There's going to be professional societies, so the ACM and other engineering societies say, here's what it means to be an ethical engineer. And I think there's going to be third-party certification. <clears throat> so if we think back 100 years or so, there was a, a new technology that was exciting and powerful, but also a bit scary, and that's electricity. And uh, things were exploding. And so <clears throat> underwriter laboratories came in and say, uh, we're going to put a stamp on your toaster that says this is not going to kill you. And that won a lot of public trust. People believed in that because it wasn't just coming from the manufacturers. It was coming from a, a neutral third party. And it turns out that this month, I actually joined Underwriters Laboratory's advisory board, and they're uh, spinning up a new effort on AI safety. Uh, so so uh, I, I saw that analogy, uh, uh, and then I was really surprised to learn that they were actually doing it and was happy to be able to join them. Now, what can we say about these foundation models? So the first is they're based on an amazing technology. And in fact, I'm demonstrating that technology. So I'm wearing this shirt, which uh, reproduces the cave paintings at Lascaux. So this was one of the first times in which the human race said, we're going to represent something, and we're going to write it down in a format that can be read later on. And first, it was through art. And later, it was through written language. And that's how foundation models work. Because there's so much that has been written down in the, in the forms of photos and in the forms of the printed word. And all we have to do is read that. And we learn an amazing amount about society and the world. So that's the technology that's most amazing. Yeah, there's data science and AI stuff. That's cool, too. But the fact that we as a species wrote all this stuff down, that's what's really incredible. So it's based on this big data. Uh, it has the advantage of being unsupervised, so you don't have to spend a lot of time labeling. It's multimodal. We have uh, uh, text and images, 
And in some cases, we're starting to have video. We probably need another advance in computing power to be able to really take advantage of all the video uh, in the world. It's multitask. You can ask questions. You can summarize. You can solve problems. You can translate from one language to another. All these different tasks all through one model. Uh, it's still improving with scale. So every few months, you see somebody comes out, and they built a new model, and it's bigger, and it turns out to be better. Eventually, we got to expect this to asymptote out, but it hasn't happened yet. And it's all based on this fill-in-the-blank technology. So I fill in what, what word should go there? Well, that would be a good word to, to, to fill in there. So the, all, that's all these models do, is you cover up one of the words and say, guess what word is there? And when it gets good at guessing, it's good at doing all these other tasks, too. It's just incredible. And every week or so, it seems like foundation models are doing something that people said they could never do, saying, uh, yeah, they're good at doing this, but they'll never be able to really reason. They'll never be able to do explanation. Here's an example of explaining a joke. Not a very good joke. Uh, the joke is, did you see that Google just hired an eloquent whale for their TPU team? It showed them how to communicate between two different pods. And the AI model responds, though the reason that's funny is because pods can mean either a pod of whales or a, a pod of computer chips. So again, not too funny, but a pretty good explanation to the degree that it is funny. OK, so we've got to get the ethics of foundation models right. We've got to think about uh, protected groups. And how do you do that? Well, first decide on what groups uh, deserve this kind of protection. And I think that should go by self-identification. And, and we want to allow people to self-identify and then work on those groups. Uh, measure the benefits and harms per group. And adjust the system to mitigate those harms. And I want to point out that, that just race and gender blindness won't work. So you know, the first thing you might think of is saying, well, I've got a database column. I'm going to delete the, uh, the race and gender column, and then I can't have any bias. Uh, but that doesn't work because the other columns predict those columns. And so you're just building in that bias. So we've got to go beyond that. Uh, and things like federated learning, differential privacy, and homomorphic encryption will help in a ways that, that we can gather this data and we can work on it without having a, uh, a target of a data set that could be uh, uh, open to attack. OK, so what are some of the, the types of things that we want to be able to protect against? Uh, well, one is <coughs> users asking questions that we, that, uh, we don't want to engage in, or we, or we want to uh, stop, or, uh, stop those users from using the system in the wrong way. <coughs> so what do they say? Uh, what do you think of uh, Soros in, in triple parentheses? Now, if you had sanitized all the input to take away all the, uh, the stereotype stuff, you'd say, what, what does that mean? I don't know. Uh, but if you've trained on everything and then told the system the difference between good and bad, then it could say, you know, I, I think this is a uh, trope for uh, an anti-Semitic attack, and I don't want to engage in this. Or if you ask the system, design a virus that will kill people, uh, if it knew a lot of biochemistry, maybe it could say, oh, I got a great idea. But we have to tell the system that that's not OK, or write an untraceable ransomware program. So, uh, these large models are getting pretty good at writing programs now. It's got to know that that's beyond what it's supposed to do. And so we're learning new ways to uh, program these systems. And we have this incredible tool. And now we have to learn how to, how to control it by uh, prompt engineering, by coming up with better inputs, by chaining models together, and so on. We have a lot of tools. It's going to be a brave new world of trying to figure out how to control those tools. Well, I started out writing code by hand. Then I started uh, building uh, uh, small scale models. And now we have this new tool, and we have to learn how to tame it. And I think we're, we're building an exciting set of uh, uh, tool chain to be able to do that. So thank you. Welcome, Andrew Ng, founder of Google Brain, co-founder of Coursera. Hey, everyone. 
It's really good to see all of you in person here in San Francisco, um, and the online viewers as well. It's also good to see you. So this is a data and AI summit, and I wanted to speak with you today about data-centric AI development and the shift from big data to good data. Over the last 10, 15, 20 years, I've been excited about the work that all of us collectively have been working on to democratize access to AI. And I think AI machine learning can't reach its full potential until it's accessible to everyone. And for the next step of that journey that I think all of us are on, are on together, data-centric AI will be key to unlocking that next era. Uh, but what does that mean? Over the last many decades, the conventional approach to machine learning and AI development has been the model-centric approach, in which you know that AI systems require writing code to implement your algorithm or your model, and then training that on data. And the conventional paradigm for a lot of machine learning development was to download the data, hold it as fixed, and then iterate on the code or the algorithm or the model. Thanks to this paradigm of development, we've collectively made a lot of progress in developing modern neural network and decision tree and other architectures. Because of that, I find that for a lot of practical applications, and I know many practitioners here, I hope this will resonate with you, for a lot of practical applications, it's become more efficient to even hold the code fix, take a good modern implementation of a neural network, do a robust hyperparameter search, but beyond that, to then focus more of your attention on entering the data. So data-centric AI is the discipline of systematically entering the data used to build an AI system. And my experience has been, for many applications, I've gone to the team and said, hey, everyone, that cutting-edge neural network thing you have, it works just fine. Let's stop messing with the code. The only thing we'll do is engineer the data. And giving that direction to the team resulted in faster progress. But the shift to systematically entering the data is, I think, where all of us, I hope, can get better at. <coughs> You may have seen studies like this uh, widely cited McKinsey one, estimating that AI will change all industries, from retail, travel, transport, logistics, and many others. But candidly, when I look across you know, many different companies, I see AI having transformed consumer software internet companies, tech companies, but its impact on all of these other industries feels much more nascent. And why is that? Let me share with you what I think are the two biggest barriers to AI adoption in the rest of the economy and the rest of the industry. First is small data sets. I've been doing a lot of work in uh, computer vision. Uh, Landing AI, I've been writing software to make computer vision super easy. And so uh, one, talking to manufacturing customers, for example, about their computer vision applications. And <clears throat> it turns out that um, I asked the manufacturing audience, how many images do you typically have of defects you want to detect? You know, manufacturing something, take a picture, you want to detect defects. And this was the answer given by the manufacturing audience, where the most common answer was 50 or fewer images. I once built a face recognition system using, I think, 350 million images. But in tech that you know, we built for hundreds of millions of images, it just doesn't work when the data set sizes are much smaller. And there are a lot of applications outside consumer software internet where you do not have a billion users or hundreds of millions of users, and the data sets are just much smaller, and you either have to get it to work on a small data set or else it's just not going to work. The second barrier to widespread adoption is, I think, the customization or the long tail problem. Here's what I mean. If you were to take all current and potential AI projects and sort them in decreasing order of value, you might get a curve that looks like this where maybe the single most valuable you know, AI model in the world, maybe some online ad system for some large website, <clears throat> maybe the second most valuable is some web search thing, maybe the third most valuable is some product recommendations thing for online e-commerce. And so our community, we figured out for these you know, hundreds of millions of dollars or billion dollar applications, how to get a large team of dozens or even hundreds of AI engineers to build it, deploy it, maintain it. We know how to do that. But once you go to other industries, Tick Manufacturing, where I've been, do, I've been doing a lot of work, <clears throat> there could be a company making pharmaceutical pills that needs to inspect them, or a separate company um, making sheets of steel that needs that inspected, or another company making semiconductor wafers that needs to inspect that. And what I'm seeing is that there are a lot of $1 to $5 million projects that are individually valuable, but that we don't yet have the right recipe or the right way to execute. 
And there are, I think, tens of thousands of these projects. And the collective value of all of these projects in the long tail, I think, could be even greater than the value of the projects in the head. Um, but once you go outside consumer software internet, you no longer have these giant databases of homogenous users. Um, and so the challenge is, how do we help various industries get these tens of thousands of projects executed without any, any one company having to hire tens of thousands of machine learning engineers to go in to do all the customization? This is an industry, AI industry-wide problem. And I think the only way out of this dilemma <coughs> is to build vertical platforms that lets the end customer do the customization, to let the IT personnel in the manufacturing plant build and train their own custom AI model. Um, and so I think for, to democratize access to AI, to make it accessible to more people, we need vertical platforms to enable the end customer to build the custom AI system that they need. And they do need a custom AI system because pictures of pills look nothing, nothing like pictures of sheets of steel, look nothing like semiconductor wafers. And so each of them, they, they just need a custom AI system for whatever they need to inspect. Now, if you were to go to the IT personnel of a manufacturing plant and say, hey, I need you to invent the next generation of transformer neural network architecture or something, you know, that's actually pretty challenging. But I think that a more accessible path to empowering a lot of people to build AI systems is to provide tools to engineer the data because it's by empowering people to engineer the data that they can then express their domain knowledge about what is the defect in a pill, or what is the defect in a sheet of steel, and so on, so that they can express the domain knowledge to build the AI system that they need for their application. Hence, data-centric AI. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, my son went to start a daycare a few weeks ago. I keep catching these bugs from him. But I tested negative for COVID today and yesterday, so I should be OK. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, they'll, they'll see you with, with kids very empathized. Thank you. First time someone clap for me coughing, but thank you. Um, so when we start to engine the data, especially on problems where we have smaller data sets, I've been surprised over and over at how effective you can build a machine learning system with just you know, 50 images, so long as the data is well chosen and accurately labeled. So if you don't have big data, I try to strive for good data, but what does that mean? If you're building a supervised learning system to learn an input X to output Y mapping, say computer vision, input an image, output a label, what, what does a good data set mean? I think a good data set should have consistent and accurate labels, Y. Um, the inputs X should be representative of the data distribution and be high quality. And, uh, post and the data should also reflect post-deployment changes, reflect concept of data drift, if any. Uh, let me dive a little bit more into detail in some of these concepts with some illustrations. So consistent and accurate labels, why? If you're inspecting a pharmaceutical pill, there's like a small, you know, one centimeter wide pharmaceutical pill, it turns out that labelers will often, well-meaning, hardworking, very smart labelers will often label um, images inconsistently. For example, label, label one may label that a chip, label two causes a scratch. Who's right? I don't know. Either of them could be right. Or um, inconsistency in bounding box sizes. One labeler will say, oh, looks like the discoloration is here. Second labeler will say, looks like that's the discoloration. Neither of them is wrong. I find that when labels are inconsistent, it usually means I didn't write clear enough labeling instructions. Um, or labeler one may say, ah, let me draw a bounding box to show you the chips. Labor two might say, oh, let me draw the bounding box there. So well-meaning, hardworking, very smart, very experienced labelers will label images inconsistently. And what I've seen is many data sets where these inconsistencies just sit there for months or years or even longer. And this makes the thing you're trying to learn very confusing for the learning algorithm. So let me go to my laptop. <coughs> well, all right, a lot of laptops here and show you a quick demo. So my team's been executing a certain um, recipe in uh, computer vision. And I'm going to share this recipe with you because I think others hopefully can execute this recipe in other domains as well. So we found that one of the you know, almost basic features that turns out to be very helpful is a team editable, we call it a defect book or label book, to let the team collaborate to clearly define what exactly you want to label images as. So for example, and, and surprisingly, we found that having teams spend a lot of time discussing and debating these label definitions, what is the discoloration? How do you want to draw the bounding box? Um, what is the scratch versus what is a chip? 
uh, and then to give very clear labeling instructions where to draw the boundary box. This is kind of stuff that found that teams spend editing these labeling instructions has some of the highest ROI of the various things that a machine learning team might do. Uh, could we go back to the slides, please? Cool, thank you. <coughs> oh, excuse me. It turns out that even the uh, most revered data sets in machine learning, you know, the classic data sets you read up on the news, have errors in them. Uh, for example, ImageNet. This image was labeled tub. Uh, this image was labeled a passenger car. Um, this image in MNIST was labeled 8, um, and that was labeled a one-star review. So actually, uh, there's a re really nice paper by Northcutt that pointed out some of these errors, and even some of the most revered data sets in machine learning. And so I think for a lot of our data sets, especially if you want to work on small data sets, you want something to work on you know, 50 images or 100 images or, or just hundreds of images rather than millions of images, the ability to have tools to align on what is the right label and clean up labels will make a huge difference to your algorithm's performance. Um, I find that thinking of data engineering as part of the ML workflow has also been a shift in you know, my thinking, a lot of teams thinking as we shift from model-centric to data-centric AI development. So many of you will have seen something like this workflow where you train a model and then carry out error analysis to see where the algorithm isn't working well enough yet. And then we would go back to tune the model, tune hyperparameters, learning rate, neural network architecture, whatever. Shift is instead of, if instead of tuning the model, we instead think about how to tune the data where if something isn't working well enough yet, let's go back and see how you can improve the data. Um, and <clears throat> I think data cleaning, I no longer think of it as a, quote, pre-processing step that you do once before, you know, like the real work of machine learning happens. I don't think that's the right way to think about it. I think data cleaning or improvements to the data is a core part of the iterative process of machine learning development. We used to tell these jokes like, hey, did you know 80% of machine learning is data cleaning? Like, it's a joke. But to me, if 80% of our work is improving the data, then that is the core part of a machine learning engineer or data scientist. And where we should work toward is better tools to make that data improvement process much more systematic. Um, now, one key idea is we always want better data, but we have a data set, you know, even dozens or hundreds of images. How do you make the data better, right? You can always like, kind of look at everything. There's just too much to do. When you have so much data, where do you focus your attention? So um, I want to show you another quick demo of agreement-based labeling, which is a tool. Could you go back to the laptop, please? <clears throat> um, to help show where one might want to improve the data. So let's see. In this example, we had uh, three labelers, uh, Michael, me, Andrew, and Nicole, label the data. And we're not having three people to label the data to just vote, right? A lot of crowdsourcing, oh, let's have a whole bunch of people label it and then take the average. You could do that when you have massive data sets and massive labeling you know, teams. But I think it's even more interesting when we build tools to identify le where labelers disagree. So we have three people label it, this small data set and uh, have computed an agreement score. So this image has a high agreement score. Michael thinks that's a, the defect, um, I think, you know, that's the defect, Nicole, me, Michael. Very similar. Let me sort it in, look at the images of the lowest agreement score. For this image, Michael drew a bounding box like that. Um, I drew bounding boxes like that. And Nicole drew a bounding box like that. And the purpose of a tool like this is um, it allows you to ask a few labelers to label similar images, not for the purpose of just taking a vote, but for the purpose of surfacing where exactly are the disagreements so you can get the team together, revise the labeling instructions, and then drive the labeling team toward a higher level of consistency. So this level of automation to enable collaborative workflows has turned out to be an efficient way um, in the projects I've been working on the landing AI to help many teams quickly improve the quality of the data and get good results, even if you have only you know, dozens or hundreds of images or relatively modest data set sizes relative to the stuff you tend to read in the news. Uh, can we go back to the slides, please? Thank you. Um, so, when you have a large data set like this, you know, how do you know what's wrong with the data, right? You, you kind of want to look at every image, check the labels, it's just too much. But tools like agreement-based labeling lets you have a systematic way 
to focus on the slice or the subset of the data, we say of all of these images, it looks like that subset, maybe the chip defect is a problematic one, lets you focus your attention to have the labelers figure out, oh, you, you, you agree just fine on scratch and discoloration, but the chip defect, that's where the problem is. So you focus attention and improve just a slice of the data where it's problematic, and that causes seems to be much more efficient with these collaborative tools. <coughs> um, and in terms of um, improving the talk about quality of Y, also quality of X, um, I think that tools that help you surface problems in the data also help you figure out where your inputs X have a problem. So for example, if I give you these six images and ask you to detect pills in you know, pharmaceutical pills, I don't know, can't really tell what's going on. But if I take out those three images, which were poorly imaged, poor focus, poor contrast, and leave just those remaining three, your data set, even though it's half the size, is actually much clearer. So I find that one of the things we sometimes um, don't do enough of is take images like that on the left and work on, this really blurry, right? But work on the imaging design and work on the sensor modalities in order to, so we just adjust the contrast and focus and create a much higher quality image. But again, data has so many problems that tools to help focus your attention on the subset to work on is really important for driving the team's performance. And in fact, <clears throat> on the same theme, you know, we always want more data, right? Machine learning, hey, I'd love to have more data. But again, if you ask the team to go out, please collect more data, that's very difficult because there's so much data to collect of everything. But when you have tools, error analysis tools, to tell you of all of this data, maybe the subset that you have the hardest problem, the biggest problem with is a scratch defect. So instead of collecting more data of everything, um, I would like the labor team or the image acquisition team to just collect a lot more pictures of scratches. You know, don't worry about discoloration, um, don't worry about chips, just collect more data of scratches. Then again, the data acquisition team can be much more targeted, much more efficient in terms of where to focus attention to collect more data. I think for the last few decades, experienced machine learning engineers have been doing this intuitively. You know, some experienced person will walk in and say, hey, look at, look at this, let's get more pictures of scratches. But the tooling to make this more systematic will help democratize access and set up a lot more teams for success. Now, <clears throat> before I break, there's, there's one more core idea I, I, I hope to share with you, which is that um, machine learning has always been a very iterative process. And I find that as we shift toward data-centric AI, the ability to iterate quickly has become even more important. When I was you know, in an early stage of machine learning, when I spent most of my time tuning neural network architectures or hyperparameters, I would train a model, do error analysis, and then you say, all right, I want a bigger neural network. Or maybe you know, swap out YOLO for ResNet, or change the neural, neural, neural network architecture or something. But those moves, they weren't always that intuitive. But when you're entering the data, it actually feels very organic. I train a model, I say, oh, made a mistake there? Well, let me label more images like that. Or, oh, made a mistake there? Looks like I messed up my labeling. Let me fix my labeling errors. And so examining data for subject matter experts, or for machine engineers, or for data scientists, is actually very intuitive, because look at the picture, see what's wrong, fix it, and move on. And the ability to iterate quickly through this loop has a huge impact on um, driving developer productivity. And this is true. Uh, can you go back to the laptop, please? Um, th this is true both for uh, pre-deployment development as well as for post-deployment uh, monitoring and uh, uh, adapting of the model to get data drift and concept drift. So let me show you a quick demo. By the way, actually, do you, do you, do you all, uh, yeah, I, I've been working, landing lens, we work on everything from, I don't know, error imagery to pharmaceutical inspections to look at cells under microscope slides to a lot of medical imaging applications, agriculture applications. But actually, do you, do you guys have a preference? Would you rather see a segmentation demo or a uh, object detection demo? You guys? Both? Why? Wait, all right. I'm hearing very mixed shouts. You know what? Let me let me do the let me do the segmentation one. All right, just just to show something different. Um, so spend a lot of time thinking about how to make computer vision super easy. So this is a data set where uh, zero and you want to detect foreign objects, you know, like screws that that may be in the food supply, and so common, you know, labeling interface, quite standard, right? Upload images, label it, and so on. I label all but one image. There, just label that image. And then 
um, put a lot of time into developing a UI so that you can um, upload and upload. I guess we have uh, 27 images. You show you saw me label one image in like I don't know four or five seconds, and then um, with Auto ML like features, you know, upload the data set, label the data set, and then click a single button <clears throat> and have a learning algorithm train a model for you. And because data centric AI feels so organic, it's human in the loop to fix the data um, and pass subject matter experts to look at what's wrong and fix the data and, you know, fix a few labels, retrain, fix a few labels, retrain. You can iterate very quickly. And so, to make computer vision super easy, uh, which is what I've been focused on, but I hope you take this type of recipe and apply it to other applications as well, I find that having a workflow that lets you have an intuitive UI like this, upload images, um, drag and drop, draw a bounding box that I just did, upload a defect book if you wish, um, and then click a button and have a lot of the hyperparameter tuning or choices of the hyperparameter automatically chosen, that makes the developer you know, much more efficient, right? Maybe while this is running, sh should finish in just a minute, right? For image segmentation, you know, kind of very similar workflow, right? Sorry, all right. Well, a variety of labeling tools, some with more intelligence than others. And again, whether it's image classification or uh, there, just label that, not a great label, and click, click, chain, chain. Oh, all right, good. And so, the models finished training, um, well, and so this is the entire data set, right? And you never know what's going to happen with these live demos. This is actually a live demo, just trained in the cloud. So let's look at the depth set images. Uh, so the algorithm did not train on these images. It actually looks pretty good, right? It's finding, hopefully, it's uh, you know, right? this, this is an honest, real training. I, I labeled one image as trained. I actually honestly didn't know what was going to happen. Looks like it actually you know, did a pretty good job finding the uh, screws in the development set. Um, and so, can we go back to the slides, please? <coughs> so, what you saw me just do was in three minutes label one image. I technically need to label dozens of images and train a model. And so, in sometimes in just minutes, you can go through this development loop and drive very rapid progress of your learning algorithm. Right? All right, let me just wrap up. Um, even though I've talked about computer vision, that's what, because that's what I've been working on, you know, Atlanta AI, a lot of the ideas I talked about are a recipe that I hope, you know, many others as well can execute in other domains in computer vision to take these ideas and empower a lot more people to use cutting edge machine learning. Over the last 10, 15 years, scaling up data sets and models has driven a lot of progress. In fact, 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, I was shouting loudly, let's start using GPUs, let's use big data. Right? But, but collectively, the community's made a lot of progress scaling up models and data. But with the maturity of today's models, I think many, not all, many applications will make faster progress if we instead shift to entering the data. Um, with technology development, you often see this pattern. Initially, a handful of experts will do something intuitively. So maybe 15 years ago, there was a handful of experts coding up neural networks in C++, right? Error prone, but a few people get it to work. And then with publications, the ideas become more widespread, and then a lot of people could code up neural networks in C++, so still kind of error prone. And then eventually, there were tools like TensorFlow and PyTorch that made the application of deep learning more systematic, and that empowered a lot more people to successfully build deep learning models. In the case of data-centric AI, I think we have been here for a long time. We've had experts intuitively make data decisions. Um, I think we are now firmly, you know, many teams publishing papers, letting the principles become more widespread. And I feel like where we need to go as a community still is to build more tools to make the application of these ideas more systematic. Because also then, it would be great if we can empower the subject matter experts in the factories, in the hospitals, the logistic networks, and the aero imagery companies, all of those companies to build their own AI systems. Um, <clears throat> what I did not talk about in this talk was structured data. Data-centric AI absolutely applies to so the principles a little bit different, and data pipelines and data cascades, which tends to add a lot of complexity to data-centric AI, but many of these ideas are still very important for entering the data. 
And let's just share additional resources. Uh, my team at DeepLearn.ai publishes a weekly newsletter called The Batch. It's actually, I think we have an issue going out today to talk about uh, career advice for uh, AI developers, machine learning engineers. But um, I often share you know, cutting edge observations about data centric AI in The Batch. So go to thebatch.ai your, on your cell phone and, and subscribe to that if you want to get updates. And uh, we've also, with collaborators, been building up data centric AI resource hub to try to get the community to build and share these ideas more broadly. So, with that, let me wrap up and say um, democratizing access to AI will benefit everyone. And I do think that as this community, you have the data and AI community that holds the key to fleshing out the ideas and tools for data centric AI to unlock this next era. Thank you very much.